Hello, Gordon. Uh, my name is Keith Folk. I am the Digital Media Services Supervisor for the Joliet Public Library. We are in the Joliet Public Library in Joliet, Illinois. Today's date is August 8th, 2017, and I'm going to ask you to state your name and organization affiliate, if any. Uh, the veteran's full name, the date and general location, uh, which we just covered the interview in. So, um, to state your name. Gordon Parks, and I live at 816 North Rainer in Joliet, Illinois. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to start the biological details, and we have uh, quite a few questions to ask you. Uh, we want to get to know you again. Thank you for coming in. Where and when were you born? October 28, 1946, in Phoenix, Arizona, Maricopa County. Who are or were your parents and what are were their occupations? My father was a civil engineer, land, or a land surveyor. My mother was a nurse. Who are your siblings? I have two living, my older sister Charlotte and my younger sister Kathy. I've lost three brothers, Ed, Bobby, and I think his name was Daniel. It was long before I was up and about, I was probably two or three. Did any family members serve in the military? My father and my uncle, but none of my siblings. What were you, do, what were you doing before you entered the service? Playing hooky in high school. Um, did that, uh, uh, playing hooky, did that, uh, was that a choice then to go into the service? Uh, was, uh, were you, uh, did you enlist or were you drafted or? No, I, I enlisted. It was uh, my, my way of doing a patriotic thing. And uh, I didn't even know, I, I knew what the draft was, but I didn't, I didn't pay any attention to it because I was 17 and then my parents wanted me to move out to California. So they sent me out to my, my aunt's house, her and her girlfriends. So. Lived out there until I joined the Navy. On which branch of the military did you serve? Of course, it was the Navy. The Navy and the Air Force. Ah. Uh, what war did you serve in? The tail end of the Cuban crisis and the very beginning of the Vietnam crisis. And can you give us a little bit of feel of that time that was still during the Cold War? Hmm. Well, let's see. For the Navy, I was stationed in Key West, and that was the tail end of the Cuban crisis. I never saw them, but I heard that we had some nuclear-tipped warheads on our base, but I never could, uh, never tried to dwell into that. I was more into doing my job, staying out of trouble. Why did you choose uh, the Navy as a specific branch of the military? Well, I was a little skinny guy, so the Marines were out. I didn't want to dig trenches for the army, so the army was out. And uh, beyond the ocean, I, I, I was born and raised in Arizona, so I didn't see much ocean. 
So it, it was basically a no-brainer on that one. So would you would you consider that an adventure then? Oh, absolutely. What was the highest rank that you achieved in the Navy? E4. And what was the highest rank later when you uh, joined the Air Force? I lost one rank and I gained it back. Um, I think within a year, maybe a year and a half. I don't know. Were you a Guard member or active military? I was after the Navy. I, I was required to put two years of active reserve in, which didn't amount to anything. I didn't even go to meetings, which was normal government, you know. Procedure. Yeah. Uh, do you recall your first days of service? What, what did it feel like to join the Navy? In, in what do you mean? The first days in boot camp? Yes. Oh, shit. <laughs> Oh, man, that, it was a different world. I mean, it was a totally different world. Stepping off that bus in San Diego, I thought it was going to be peaches and cream. <laughs> but I, I guess within two or three days, I learned that this is going to be a real deal. So what, uh, what shocked you first? Or what, what couldn't you get used Probably to? Probably being yelled at by the uh, company commander, yelling at us all the time. And how did you feel? I can take it. Okay. Uh, where did you go through basic training? San Diego. In, uh, pertaining to basic training, I had an instance where I was on guard duty. And my bunkmate had uh, some socks that weren't folded right. And the company commander came through a surprise inspection. Well, I was just getting off guard duty, so I didn't know what was going on. So we were falling out by our bunks. Company commander comes walking through and he looks through my stuff. He finds a pair of socks that weren't folded properly. And he just tore into my ass. I mean to tell you, I was, I was beat around that room probably once or twice. And then he sent me down to uh, some general, along with the guy that put the sock in there. And we did jumping jacks for eight solid. How did you do that? That's, I don't know. It sounds like almost impossible. <laughs> We'd get tired out and he'd come back in and he'd go like this. And we, there was a piece of sheet metal on the, on the wall. You know, it wasn't a solid wall like the granite wall. <laughs> it was mainly for noise and uh, terror. But it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Kept us going, and uh, I remember not being able to march for about three days. <laughs> Both of us would be walking behind the group. Uh, my next question is, did what you learned in basic training make you question everything you knew before you joined? <laughs> oh. To question everything you knew before you joined. <laughs> so no, I, I questioned more of when I got out than when I joined. I, I didn't know what I was getting into when I first joined up.
Um, do you recall your instructors? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If so, what were they like? He was a decent guy. He was always honest, but it was for a good reason. You know, it was to get us to uh, act like sailors. I mean, just just walking down the hallway, you can tell if a guy was in the service. Chances are, if he's on. If he's walking against you and he's on the right side of the walkway and he's coming at you, he wasn't in the service. You always walk on the same the same way you drive your car, on the right side. And in the service, especially in the Navy, it just stands to reason because those hallways were so thin. You had to be a designated side. Otherwise, you're going to be in the way. And they have to shoot you and throw you overboard. <laughs> uh, what did you do after basic training? After basic training, they sent me to Memphis, Tennessee for six months of jet engine repair. Yeah, we did. we did everything from basic tune-ups to complete overhaul of jet engines. And uh, it was good, I loved it. My father, I guess I, you could say I was following in my father's footsteps because he was in the Army Air Corps and he was a uh, fighter uh, mechanic, engine mechanic. And it just so happens I ended up being a jet engine mechanic. And it wasn't, it wasn't that I was trying to follow in his footsteps, it just kind of fell in my lap. The boot camp, they said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I don't care. Oh, you want to be on an aircraft carrier, push airplanes? I said, I don't care. <laughs> All right. Uh, what, what kind of uh, planes did you work on? What models? Uh, let's see. In the Navy, I worked on P3s, P3 Orions, S2Fs, Sikorsky Nighthawks, Sikorsky is a helicopter. Yes. The first ones you mentioned are fighters? No. No. The P-3 Orion is a, uh, you might see it when they, they've got a Hurricane Hunter flying out. Usually it's got a long tube coming out of the tail end. Well, that's a sonar boom. And uh, they'll drop sonar buoys from the belly of the aircraft while they're flying into the water and then those will ping on the uh, whatever's in the water and it will relay that information back up to the plane so that's the hurricane hunters is what they go what they use them for now but uh, we use them to find submarines in our squadron. And the S or the P2 was the same thing. It was a sub hunter. And uh, S2F was basically a sonar dropper. They could fly a lot further out and drop those in the helicopters. But I didn't I didn't fly on those machines. I, I kept the birds up. There was a lot of maintenance to do on fine tuning and all. Did you ever, ever have to fly to like uh, uh, test your work if there was uh, circumstances? You had to go in here with the plane? No, I didn't have anything? to, but I would if they asked me. Uh, there were a couple of times when I went up after we did a major 
achievement on the aircraft, on the engine. A lot of times. Because there, there's a lot of maintenance on those things. You, you, get, you get a different pilot flying every other day. You know, everybody flies differently. They all have some idiosyncrasy that's, they know that this aircraft is gonna have a tick in it. So, you know, you gotta just work with it. There's, there's probably close to 100 hours of maintenance for every hour of flying time. That's amazing. Um, so your job assignment was uh, aircraft repair. And um, how did you adapt to military life? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And we're, and we're also including the physical regimen, the barracks, the food, the social life. Uh, the barracks was good. I think after one year of being in Key West, they, they finished off uh, two brand new barracks, four-story barracks. And uh, we moved into that and they, that was a cat's meow. I mean, brand new, never been used. <laughs> and uh, chow was good. Eat as much as you want. Work was about a mile away. But uh, generally, you could get a ride out. If, you know, there was either a bus going out every 15 minutes to the hangars, or you could always walk. And, and where were you stationed at this time, in the beginning? Key West. Key West. Yeah. And did you move anywhere else in the Navy? No, not in the Navy. No. Uh, they stuck me after Memphis, jet engine school, they, they sent me to uh, Key West, Boca Chica to be exact. It's the Naval Air Station there. And uh, I was assigned to VX-1, which is a, uh, the V is for heavier than air, and the X was for exploration, I believe. And we were the first squadron for that. So now tell me, uh, so that's, we've covered the Navy a little bit. Uh, tell me how you jumped to the Air Force. Uh, finally got out of the Navy and uh, I jumped from job to job. I owned a, bought a, auto repair shop in Miami and uh, that didn't float well. I learned a big lesson in life. You don't open up a uh, car repair shop two blocks from the entrance of the main shipping road from the freighters in Miami because you got 24 hour traffic. I mean, all day, all night long, just semis going by. I mean, you, you can't even basically walk across, let alone drive across. So nobody could get to your shop? No. Okay, <laughs> okay. So. And I was out just, just under five years, and I thought, shit, I wonder if I can go back in. Sure enough, they said, yeah. You lose one one rank. I says, I don't care. I can get it back. So went in and uh, my hey. first assignment was Sumter, South Carolina. Of uh, Fort Sumter? No. Near okay. No, Sumter Air Force Base. Okay. It's uh, forty miles east of Columbia. South Carolina. 
And let's see, what did we do there? That was helicopters also. I don't recall what we did there, what our main objective was. I was there for a year, then I got orders to go to uh, Hickam Air Force Base in Honolulu, Hawaii. Another tough assignment. But I enjoyed it, to say the least. When you returned to service in the Air Force, did you have to go through any kind of refresher course or basic training? No. 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 So you hit the ground running? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so how is, how is your life there? Yeah, again, a physical regimen, barracks, food and social life? Honolulu. Food was probably better, in my opinion, in the Air Force. But both of them were pretty good, you know, because my mom, God bless her, she wasn't that good at cooking. <laughs> <laughs> so. so what did you do for, so, for social life? In, in I dove. I was, uh, I've been skin diving and scuba diving since I was probably 12. In, in Arizona? Yeah. Believe it or not. Wow. Was there like a, something deep, like a quarry? Or? No, it was like the lake. Wow. Yeah. What? I think it was Canyon Lake. Yeah. Um, so we talked about, uh, you really didn't have any wartime service um, in a foreign country, correct? No. All in, all in the United States. Um, so some of these questions, uh, let's see. What kind of food did you eat? In, in yeah. the service? Yeah. Was there anything uh, special, like, like say, if you were in Honolulu, uh, you would be eating, you know, the, the food that was there, the native food? I mean, outside the, outside the, uh, the camp? Was your social life? What did you eat? Well, you'd have the same thing, you know, yeah. in any town, you know, McDonald's, Burger King's, whatever. And the base uh, food was, you know, normal yeah. stuff. Okay. Hot dogs, hamburgers, turkey every now and then. So it's basically all, yeah. all American food, something right. like that. Now, did you ever eat any of the uh, meals ready to eat, like K rations or C rations? Yes. And they have a question here. Uh, did uh, you ever have the chocolate covered oatmeal cookie bars? Uh, what are the best of any of those packaged uh, meals ready to eat that you liked or didn't like? None of them were really good. <laughs> so that's pretty I mean, much. Think about it. It's food that was prepared. Two or three years ago, uh, I didn't get sick over them, but I, you know, I'd much rather not have to eat them. We got them a couple of times when they they had hurricanes come through down in Key West. Did you have to participate in uh, any evacuation or emergency? No, they just. Packed everybody in, in our, that wasn't buried, in our barracks. I mean, we had them sleeping on the floors everywhere. But it's a brand new building. <laughs> and it was four floors high, so yeah. <laughs> who's worried about the, the water coming up there? If it keeps rising, you just go next floor up. <laughs> um. So you pretty much enjoyed all your years in both services oh, and yes. uh, um, got to see the United States and Hawaii. Yeah. Is there something you would have liked to go to uh, overseas? Well, we flew down to, from Key West, we flew to 
Jamaica one time, flew to the Cayman Islands once, and we flew for a weekend up to Bermuda. And then we flew for a weekend out to Las Vegas for a gambling show. And I, I just, as soon as I hit the ground there, I stuck my thumb out. My parents lived down in Phoenix. So five hours after I landed in Vegas, I was in Phoenix. And I, just, I can stay until Sunday, but I have to be at the airport on the plane by one o'clock because I've got to be at the end, the other air for the air force base, air force base at four. Did you make it? Yes, I did. Did you thumb your way there? No, but I thumbed my way down. Yeah, I think I made it in about three trip, three, three different individuals. Uh, in your uh, services, did you get any medals or citations? Did you get any medals or citations? Just the normal ones. Uh, sharpshooter, I think, in uh, Vietnam Air. Something about the Cuban crisis. But nothing, nothing distinguishable. I didn't get a Purple Heart. Did you have any uh, long-term friendships with any of your service friends, service buddies? Not really. I've often wondered, you know, how would I get a hold of them? Especially the my best man, my wedding. He was born up in I think Gary, Indiana. And then there was a kid that I went to uh, jet engine school with, Wayne Lemon. I wouldn't mind look up, looking up his place and see if he's still alive. But that's, that's basically all I remember. Do you have any uh, additional duties assigned to you in both the Navy and the Air Force? Well, let's see. The Navy naturally has spent a lot of time uh, walking our post with a 45 strapped to my side. Carry anything with you as a good luck charm? No. Uh, uh, just my dog tags. How did you uh, keep in touch with family and friends? How did you contact them? Um, basically by letters. And every now and then by phone, but basically by letters. Was this ability to contact, uh, was this helpful to you, to contact your family and friends? Not really. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I wasn't homesick, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Well, yeah, they just want to get a general idea how people felt and contacting family and friends, uh, you know, was this uh, important to you? Um, uh, what do you recall of your last day of service? So that would be the Air Force. What do you mean? You know, when you got out of the Air Force, what did you do? How did you feel? Did you have a plan? What you wanted to do? Yeah, I took 30 days off. 30 days to go from San Francisco to Seattle, Seattle to Minneapolis, Minneapolis to Houston. 
I just told the wife, I said, fuck it. We're just going to take it one day at a time. And then what happened? Did you did you finally end up uh, with a position working? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I knew I was, that's why I was going to Houston. Okay. I was going to take over managing, I guess. Sandblasting company. Don't ever work for you in laws. Fuck you every time. <laughs> so you fulfilled your military service? Yes. Six years in the Navy and four years in the Air Force. So how did you how did you handle switching your mindset? when it was time to come home or go home. Was it difficult? No. Mm -hmm. How, uh, well you actually didn't, uh, it says here, how were you received by your family and community? But you really didn't go back, you, right? Well, I was married after two years in the Navy. So basically, it was just, you know, married life, newlyweds. I think we lived on a, uh, in a trailer park. That's where you have, basically, around your military bases. A lot of trailer parks. Did you go back to school after uh, your service? No, I, I finished my high school um, right after I, I get, got to uh, Key West. I started a uh, GED program, and I finished that. And then uh, one of the counselors in my, my unit said, hey, why don't you take this now? And, go up to Miami and take a test and get a high school, a Florida high school diploma. And she says, okay. So I did that. And I went back on leave and I was in my dress blues, went to my old high school, science teacher, and uh, Ronnie Baker was there. I already called to find out where he was. So I went into uh, his class. I went up to the teacher. I says, "Do you mind if I speak to Ronnie Baker for a moment?" He says, "No, oh, is he? Ronnie Baker, come on up here." So he came up. I says, "You know, you told me when I got out of high school, I jumped out of high school." and went in the Navy that I wouldn't have, I'd never get a high school diploma. I'd never get a high school diploma and I've been, all this time I'm taking out this paper from inside my jersey and I'm starting on folding it. It says, Florida high school diploma. I just, I beat you by six months. Uh. <laughs> Did you, so, did you take any advantage of the military uh, benefits, school, or uh, the GI Bill, or whatever was available to you? I did eventually, yeah, a couple years back. And I got, got in with the VA um, medical facilities, so I'm in their program. They're keeping me alive. Very good. Are you a member of any veterans organizations today? No. Uh, how did your, uh, in, in reflection, how did your military experience af affect your life? Well, it's kept me out of trouble. Okay. It definitely teaches you the difference between right and wrong. Military justice is not, not easy on you. They're a lot harder than Civilian justice. Uh, 
punctuality, drill that into you. Hurry up and wait. That's one of the first things they tell you to get used to doing. Hurry up and wait. I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> uh, what is the most positive thing you took away from your experience in the service? Capability of tearing apart a jet engine and putting it back together and having it run. That's that's an accomplishment. <laughs> so, um, could you, if when you reassembled the jet engine and you tested it, uh, could you hear? If there was something wrong, uh, oh, there were just all by kinds. Yeah. No, there were all kinds of gauges. You go by gauges. Okay. There, there might be 15, maybe 30 ga different gauges. You read those. <laughs> so it's too loud to be a, hear a clunk. <laughs> There's no... Uh, and you surely can't put your hands on it and say, oh, I feel a vibration. Oh, I look, oh look, I just fried my hands off. <laughs> so there was no uh, screwdriver to the ear? No, uh -uh. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, what message would you like to leave for future generations who will view, hear this interview? It will definitely teach you how to grow up. How to, how to take on responsibility and to be a better human being. Is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to your interview? If so, what? Take your time. The fact of me loving to fly, that, that's got to be the biggest thing I took away from the Air Force and the Navy. Because I could fly anytime I wanted to, being a mechanic, just ask for flight, flight room. And uh, I loved it. I still do. But you know that, you know, which reminds me, we're going to get that helicopter club going? Yeah, we can, yeah, we can definitely uh, talk about that again. All right. And uh, uh, Gordon has been very helpful with our drone program uh, and I uh, appreciate that immensely. Um, so, Gordon, thank you for your time and for your service to our country. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you. You're quite welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>